Now, Falcons may have indeed served the tea, as the young say nowadays, but Gamersops has tea that's even more delicious. They have their Gamer tea, and they have four different flavours. They've got a Yerba Mate. It's a nice little boost one there. Obviously, some would say, Boris, a little bit boosted. They have the Black Tea, which is just a classic one. They have this Sleepy Time with Theanine, which is a caffeine-free one, and L-theanine helps you go to sleep. It's like a precursor of certain things in the brain that help you basically relax and go off to sleep and sleep longer in theory. And they also have a ginger turmeric, which is also caffeine-free, and that one's in theory like a little bit energizing. Obviously, potentially, I think that's one that sometimes helps with the immune system or something. Like all Gamer Sups products, obviously, I enjoy their energy formulas a lot too. You can get 10% off an order of anything from the website, gamersups.gg, with my code THORIN, T-H-O-R-I-N. That's T-H-O-R-I-N, THORIN, for 10% off at gamersups.gg. If you make an order, be sure to add in some free samples just so you can try some of the other flavors out. Right, obviously, a massive drama bomb has dropped because while this major is going on, Team Fall that giant like Saudi super team who obviously aren't at the major to stay relevant they've released an episode in their sort of documentary slash reality TV series that follows the team it's called Team Falcons Pursuing the Dream Chapter 3 in this particular case it's about like you know trust the process and all that sort of jazz and there's a segment in this documentary where Zonic and the team address issues within the team and this was linked on Reddit everyone's seen it but actually I've noticed it feels like most people have only seen that segment and didn't watch the stuff before or afterwards and actually don't know anything else about Falcons. They're just going off this little drama bomb and it's caused massive discussion. And this is at a point when the team is 1-1 at the RMR to qualify to the major. And obviously we know they don't make it. And they've yet at this point in time to play the best of three because that obviously comes at the end after they go one and two because they won the first game, if you remember. Now I will point out, a lot of people don't even seem to notice that framing. A lot of people are talking as if this is the video after they lose the RMR because we now know that they did lose it and that this is them all just blaming the Boros guy and then that's the end of the video and this is supposed to excuse him being kicked. I think that's what some people are interpreting this as. So in this video, Zonic, Snappy, Madden and Magisk address their frustrations with Boros. I'll notice some pious doesn't seem to say anything for whatever reason, which is that he was late to practice, he changed his mouse before the RMR and after a great Katowice performance and that he forgot his in-ears. I think they even say two days or something or whatever they say in this video. They say he forgot his in-ears basically. Now, uh, I will say, the video itself has apparently, people say, been edited since then and some stuff's been removed. Some of this stuff hasn't been removed, so I'm not quite sure what people mean. But they say, apparently, maybe it's been, like, stealth edited after the fact because, obviously, people are very unhappy with this. In fact, I even get the sense I don't think the players are even happy with this. So, what he did... Based on what they said, and by the way, this was a big topic I already talked about on Snake and Banter. Actually, Maui Snake and Vu, our guests for that episode, had quite different takes than me. But I said I'd do a longer video and I want to get into this whole thing. So based on what they said, here's what Boros did. He was late to practice. Now, I already see that being dismissed and excused as if it's a minor issue. That is not a minor issue. I would say that is actually a major issue. That shows a lack of respect for your coach, for your teammates, for the project in general, for the tournament that you're playing in, quite frankly, for your own career and your own like self-respect that you're a top competitor and a professional who gets paid a lot of money to play in a super team, a team with world champions. I do think it's a big deal if you're the rookie and the inexperienced one to turn up a late or not to be on time or not to be there when you agreed to be there and also you're going to do that like I say when you're not the star player popping off you're not the experienced one you're not the world champion no no you're the only one in the team that is the little rookie newbie you're the one having the hardest time following the plan and understanding what is going on in the game anyway that can't happen if that's the case like, if some pious who was popping off like a motherfucker in Ents, or Magus, who's a world champion, and many, many times elevated himself, and even taken more sacrificial roles, if they somehow are late once, I can forgive that. In this particular scenario, like, you aren't them, mate. You haven't earned the status or the respect to occasionally get a pass from this. And... You are the one, because you're the little rookie, and as I'll get to, you're not even the one who's supposed to even be in this team. You're the one who needs to be doing the opposite of that. You need to be the one who's never late. You need to be the one, if anything, who's there early, who arrives first, and then who leaves last and listens to everything and tries to do every single possible thing you can, especially, by the way, everything outside the server. If you're having problems with, like, experience things and understanding decision-making and strats and the server, then do everything outside the server to be as flawless as possible. Take away every excuse outside of the server for them to give up on you or to say, we're going to move on from you. And then, 
then when they see some of your flaws, they'll know if we work on that, then we'd have an amazing teammate. No, no, you're adding reasons outside the server why they should actually boot you, no matter how good you are in the server. That's one of the things that's the silliest, especially if you're effectively on trial, primed to be replaced and need to win these people over and prove yourself when quite frankly they have no reason to need you to prove yourself they know they can go and get a simple or some other big name eventually so what reason do you have to stay well if you're doing this there's plenty of reasons for you to go now people acting like this doesn't matter already makes me feel like so many of the interpretations of this were just people putting themselves as a self-insert into where Boris was and imagining them so I would feel bad if that happened to me and I think there was a lot of bad faith interpretations in this video so let's go through the other things so he changed his mouse didn't he right everyone keeps talking like Falcons has just been bombs the whole time IEM Katowice is one of the four most important events this year. There are the two majors, this one PGL Copenhagen, then there's going to be the one in China, and then there is IEM Katowice and IEM Cologne. That's why I call them the prestige events. These are enormous events. They're the most important events in Couch Strike, even though, yes, the majors, and because of the sticker money, the RMRs, are more important technically. So that is a very important event, and Falcons was top four at that event. And not only were they top four, the team that eliminated them were the eventual champions who nobody could beat at that event. So... Yes, this is a team that had had a big performance. By the way, part of that was Boros doing fragging. Certainly other people did other things in the team and they're excellent at their roles, but actually he fragged better than people would have expected and he made some good plays. So you don't fuck with your mouse after a performance like that. Yes, other people absolutely might have done so, but did they then mega fail? And were they already a liability to their team? and the least big name on their team, and the least experienced player on their team, and someone who was forced on the team and not even the team's choice. Yeah, exactly. It's quite a different scenario, isn't it, when Boros does this from when someone else, like a superstar player, might do that. I mean, I'll tell you a story. That Simple actually did it. Because if you don't know, Simple changed his mouse before Star Ladder Berlin in 2019, when he was one of the absolute best players. It was him and Zemu, the contenders for the best player in the world. He was absolutely carrying tournaments. Even though at this point, he switched to the rifle, the Krieg, so that they could use... Um, I mean, at the time, they were just... Actually, I think this may be four because I guess Guardian came in when they did that. But yeah, basically, I think maybe they had Flame even all put times in this team. Basically, he changed to a mouse. And not only that, wasn't even a famous mouse brand. It was some, like, new mouse or something. And basically, I remember having this conversation with him where I asked him before the playoffs, why would you change your mouse? And he was telling me, like, it's got, like, the fastest left click in the world. It's even faster. And I remember being like, all right. And then in the quarters, they lost to NRG. And most people had Navi favoured to beat NRG at this point in time. And just went out of a major that they maybe even could have mixed it up won and so I even roasted him I, I, I obviously knew this guy I talked to him afterwards and I came and I just said well good news is with that mouse with the fastest left click in the world you'll be able to click check in on your flight really quick won't you you'll be instantly up and give me a break mate like you're the best player why would you ever mess with that variable and again there'll be a million stories like but this guy did it and then he actually carried the game great but Boros didn't and that is another factor where if you add it to the other things he has done and it's inferred has done behind the scenes, that's just another reason where it's like, this guy just doesn't get it. He, he just has so many extra problems and baggage that come with him. Why would we deal with it when he already is, an, is a flawed player in the game who's potentially adding stress in the game to people? Now, then there's the whole thing that he forgot his in-ears, right? So most players, they have the big headphones, especially on stage, and then they have those little in-ears that go in, and they're, they're the ones that they're used to playing with, right? People are just glossing over this one entirely. Like, not only it's that, like, oh, he didn't have the headphones he likes. No, 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 no. Like, those headphones potentially are your way to hear. What if when you don't have those, you can't hear the same? What if the ones you have aren't as good? What if you miss some things? What if you miss a call or the background sound leaks in in a different way? What happens then? What if it's just not the ones that you're used to and therefore the actual sound mix is a little bit different or some of the aspects out? It, why would you change any of these variables is the point. Being a pro, these are the basic things. If you're a professional footballer, you better have your fucking boots and you better have your game. If you're a tennis player, you better have your racket. Like... This is, this is level 101 level stuff to be a professional. And again, this isn't a professional in like... So he's not an ecstatic, guys. He's in one of the bigger orgs in the world right now that has millions of dollars, millions of dollars riding on the project. And they're trying to win millions of dollars by qualifying to this tournament. This isn't a minor thing along with the practice, along with the other shit. 
This is actually something that's a big deal at this point in time. Oh, and then also add it all together and then add the other issues lurking in the background and you're going to have a powder keg. Someone's going to blow up after all these things if you then also in the game have any sort of issues. And then they also mentioned, I know this one little bit went to the side, this whole thing about how they were, he was sitting on NVIDIA, right? Right. Imagine being in a match and you're losing the match and you look over and your teammate isn't like looking and thinking or like listening to people or like calming the odd thing. No, no. He's just in the fucking settings. He's not even watching the game. He's in the settings, just fucking around. Mm -hmm. Let me scroll up. Let me take that setting down. I can't see brightness over here. Mate, we're professionals. We're still in the game. We're engaged. I even know there's some teams, by the way, where when the player dies, it's actually their job to like calm a little bit more, to make up for room in the calm. If someone's focused or someone's watching a spot like the Orpa or keep track of the utility and say how many smokes there are or if someone's got a kit or call the rotation or something. This guy can't do that. He's in the fucking settings. Now, are people actually going to excuse him being... Are people going to excuse being late to practice where we actually, like, train to become good? Are people going to excuse not having your in ears so you might not even be able to fucking hear stuff or be comfortable? Changing your mouse so your one main strength, aiming at people, isn't as good anymore. And by the way, God forbid if he ever blamed that, because afterwards, later in the documentary, a lot of people won't have seen this, after that whole chat, he himself blames changing the mouse for why he doesn't shoot as well. But if it wasn't a big deal, why didn't he go, it's no big, yeah, I changed my mouse all the time. No, no, even he blames it. That's even his reason as to why he didn't do it. Well, if you're, you're yourself are blaming it and you're the reason why it happened, if I'm your teammate, it's like, then why the fuck do you do it? And now that I've identified, let's just cut, nip this in the bud right now. Don't ever do it again. Let's fix this today and never have this be a problem in the rest of the RMR or going on. Hence, I pointed out, this wasn't when the tournament was over. Now, on Snake and Banter, by the way, I even made the joke that, like, if you wanted to sabotage Falcons, wouldn't you try and engineer a scenario where all the things that Boros did actually happen like try and make him late so then it causes like resentment between the teammates and makes him seem unprofessional wouldn't you try and change his mouse so that he can't even fucking aim he's like what's going on with my mouse wouldn't you nick his in here so that he feels uncomfortable or maybe can't even hear all the calls and he already wasn't a guy who's understanding everything anyway as it is and then wouldn't you tell him like oh uh, listen mate if, if anything goes wrong, just start checking all your graphics settings just to piss everyone off. Like, this would be the dream for the opponent with fucking teammates like Boros. Who needs enemies? Like, mate, he's the one destroying our team from inside. Now, I will point this out. Maui said on Snake and Banter that he'd heard some other stuff about Boros and that some of it was even worse. He even said there's so much more disparaging information known about Boros behind the scenes and that basically he couldn't say it. He didn't feel comfortable saying it. I'll also just say this. I'd also before heard other complaints about Boros and so I speculate, but I am confident when I speculate, that there were more issues and that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'll even say I actually had some people in the scene reach out to me after this and basically say, you're actually right about the things you were saying there or like, did you actually know that or did you guess it's one of those scenarios if people don't know yes pros can be very unprofessional i mean think of some of the things boomich did towards the end in navi right i'll even throw this out there enough years have gone by i won't tell the stories right now but i'll tell you what i'll just put it out there you know woxic and poison those really talented mercurial orpers who like three four years ago were a big deal right the reason why you haven't seen them in a while is they have some fucking horror stories that follow them about what they did in some of their teams that just haven't gotten out to the general public but some of the players have heard those stories and that's why you just don't see their name mentioned and they've been away for a while and they're only gradually getting to come back now the problem is you just don't know those stories and they haven't ever come out publicly and by the way when we talk about the Boros stuff we're not just talking about normal stuff either we're talking about stuff that like I think is worse than this and is unacceptable so that's the rumor behind the scenes then I actually think there's a conflation of people talking about the difference between, right, criticizing someone and criticizing someone how they played in the game. Like, I think people genuinely are taking this talk and they're acting as if the discussion was about Boros not being good enough at the game and that they lost the game. And that's why I say, I think people think this is after the RMR, that they've lost the RMR and they're all blaming him for that because he's not as good at an experience as them. But that's not what's going on at all in this scenario. First of all, they go out of their way, a whole bunch of them, to say that they can lose and they can lose to better teams and it's not just about in-game performance and that they can accept losing in the game if they try their best this is not when they had already lost the tournament guys you know the info that later they lose the tournament but they didn't at the time they were having this conversation in the video they're only fucking one and one at this point in time they go one and three in the end if you don't know if they fix the issues then i am guessing they think that actually then we might qualify 
This might fix everything. We can course correct now when we just lost one game and then get it together, get through this hour bar, and then, you know, we'll all laugh about this years later. Like, hence, I think, why Maltis gives that impassioned speech where he really actually sort of opens up and makes it serious as to why he's here, what he's trying to accomplish, etc. Instead of just letting the team lose and then people going mental on him over these issues when he would then have zero chance to do anything about it. He wouldn't even have an opportunity to improve or correct it and then he would be kicked and that would be really horrible, wouldn't it? So, hence, by the way, when people have comments that are like, well, I mean, he could easily just point fingers himself and go, you didn't play well in that game. And what happened there? Didn't I carry that? It's like, no, no, no. H how could he do that? Because they're not talking about in-game performance. If anything, they're actually saying, we don't want, this is basically what Zonic, um, Nagus can say, we don't want the non-playing shit to Zonic to be a factor in whether we have to consider that we lost uh, the game. Or even when we're going into a game, we don't want non-game stuff. Stupid things about professionals. And we don't want those to even be a factor in anyone's mind going into this particular match. So then people are going to act like he can just say like, well, I headshot people and got more kills. That would be the stupidest reply and rebuttal that he could make, especially in light of the things that he has done, by the way. Imagine a football team. And before the, the match starts, when you're all on the team talk, one of the players who's a rookie has arrived late. They've crashed their car into one of their teammates, a star player's car, and scratched it all up the side and put him completely on fucking tilt. And then the player who came in, when the guy tilts and goes, you fucking wrecked my car, what are you doing, rookie? He then goes, yeah, well, you missed a fucking goal in the last game, so stop blaming me. Maybe that's why you're upset. Like, that would just be game over right there. Like, that's not the way the hierarchy works. You haven't earned the status to have that conversation. That's not even what we were talking about. You've just gone to some totally other area. We're having a discussion about something you did outside of the game right now. And by the way, this isn't minor shit. People can't make it like it is, especially when you add it all together. This all stacks, and then there's things we don't know. And by the way, I'm just going to go and speculate, but I get a sense this isn't the first time slash incident. This looks to me, from the frustration being expressed, like the straw that broke the camel's back. I already thought Boros's inclusion in the team was a little bit sus anyway, and that he was already on the outs due to his, like, player profile. All he's got is him. He's in the Danish CS system with Magus and Stappy and Sonic. They like people who can do their job and perform at a reliable level, so that you can rely on them as pieces within a machine. And if you're going to be a star, yeah, they'll give you the resources, but then you better do something with it. This is a guy where all he has is the brain and doesn't have the great reads and understanding. And then he's fucking around in a video settings. He might not even have the right headphones and might not even be his right mouse. And he was late. Are you fucking kidding me? I mean, Magus, now he's already made this comment on a past episode. I can't remember if it's hot point where a snake and banter that. Supposedly, Magus, when they were playing a game at Kanavitsi, once got frustrated in a round and basically just said, like, I can't play with this guy, referring to Boros. He is fucking up your chance if you are the other players and not even from in-game stuff, from out of the game stuff before we even get in the server. Even though this match, in history, when people look back at a Wikipedia for people like Nagus and Zonic and stuff, they won't look and go, oh, that was the tournament where uh, Boros forgot to send. They won't know that. They'll just look back and history, legacy, posterity will just say you weren't good enough to qualify. That's what this situation, that's the part of the situation that Boros' behaviour and unprofessionalism helped to create. So this is where you already know people are crazy recency bias because they're talking like Falcons was always bad. They just finished top four at one of the best events, the most important CS2 event thus far. The reason I hate the way people are like, Magus is just an asshole. He's just shitting on him. There's a moment in this video where Magus like sort of almost quivers or shakes and he actually looks like he's almost about to break into tears. He's so raw with his emotion because he cares so much in that moment. And he's not quite frankly, I think, toxically just dumping on a guy and being rude and abusive and deflecting all the blame. No, no, no. He's collectively saying we all need blame for stuff in the game, but this outside the game, I won't accept it. That's it's not that I can't I won't tolerate this. I didn't come here from vitality to fucking lose like this with someone that would never be in vitality, by the way. So then there's this whole thing of like it was bullying, right? First and foremost, understand that some of the hostility and resentment is entirely understandable for those players because this was not the player they chose to round out their lineup. Whether you're the players, whether you're the coach. It was supposed to be fucking Nico. Nico supposedly was going to join. Or some other top name could have been there as well. Maybe in a different alternate world. It even could have been inert. So it could have just been the whole events. Except Dija. And then just have someone instead of that role. Have Magus instead of Dija. Wouldn't that be a fucking insane team? So you have someone that you feel like is forced on you. And it doesn't have to be permanent. You can replace him at some point in the future. And he's not a normal player either. He's not just some good player. Generally well-rounded. He's extremely... 
extremely good, like some fucked up D&D character in one or two areas, and he's mega deficient below the love, average level of a pro in other areas, including like smart, sort of understanding how to work with people, or basic professionalism. I mean, give me a fucking break. He's way too inexperienced and doesn't, quite frankly, seem very cerebral. That's even being polite. I just don't think he seems like a very intelligent guy who can read the game. How about that? I mean, by the way, I'll just put this out there. It's not even like this is the first team this has happened in. Monty, a bunch of their players basically have made it clear they're happy they don't play with him. But wait a minute, guys. What was the first big land result for Monty? At the Blast Paris Major, they made it to the fucking quarterfinals of the Major with Boros having really good stats and fragging out. So why would you ever, when that player then it leaves the team and is benched, then be like, it's brilliant that he's going. This is like when Simple left Flipside. And Flipside was obviously going to be worse, but they were happy and bragging about it in public because he was such a fucking arsehole. They were glad to just be able to play Team CS without being screamed at all the time. Here's some quotes for you by Warro2k and SDY from Monty. So Warro2k, when he was benched, said, I think this is a very good decision. Oh, this is when they traded him to Falcons. I think this is a very good decision. It was necessary. We used him at 100%. I think he will never again show the same potential as with us because no one will understand how to use him. He has no discipline and we used him on a run and gun basis. In terms of tactics, he had to do almost nothing. Of course, he has potential. But in those circumstances, I think we had to bid farewell to him. This will only be an advantage for us and everyone gained something out of it. He made money having received, I hope, a very good contract and the team he wanted. And at the same time, Monty benefited from this too. So, I mean, by the way, it's basically implied there. You should never fucking put this guy into a tactical system. So Snappy and fucking Magus Gonzalez are shit out of luck on that one. Then how about SDY? You're going to think, well, SDY was shouting up by Simple, so there's no way this guy would ever critique him. So SDY said, after Boris was out of the lineup, now we have more structure, and I can rely on people simply not dying when we don't need to. It's much easier on T-side than it was before right now. By the way, any time IGLs and people who are like the minds and brains of a team are telling you, it's good and easier to play the game now that we don't have a person who can put up 0.7 kills per round, then you know that 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 player, his aim was the only thing keeping him in the team. The rest of the package did not add up and wasn't good enough to overcome the, like basically his aim couldn't overcome all the problems and the baggage surrounding him. And by the way, remember Monty before that major famously grinded like a motherfucker and played 1 million maps. It was actually like 159 or something, right? Or 170 or something. So they've played loads with this guy. They presumably tried a lot of different things out. They found one way to make him use as a run and gun, not involved in the tactic. Don't even need to use your brain a player. And then they're happy he left. Well, Falcons is supposed to be a bigger team, a better team than Monty with much higher aspirations and goals and presumably want to play much more high-level Counter-Strike. By the way, even Monty did, apparently. But let's be real. This guy isn't just himself like, oh, but he's a young player. No, no, he's also playing with very experienced people. He's got Magisk next to him, who's been through all those wars with Astralis, all those majors. He's got Zonic next to him, who's done it all. People call him the GOAT coach. And to some degree, Snappy hasn't had all the big files in CSGO necessarily until the end, but he's incredibly experienced as a professional player. He's been a journeyman for decades. So these are also the other players, the ones who aren't the mega experienced. Oh yeah, they're just people who were at the top of the game last year. So Madden, Sun Pius, everyone who isn't Boros is there to not just qualify to majors. That should be a minimum expectation. For a Boros, just qualify would be good. They're there to go to majors and to win majors and to win championships. Magus Gonzonic left the best team in the world and the reigning major champions and probably one of the closest things to a lock to make top four at the next major you could have to come to this project. Snappy, Madden, and Sun Pius left the top five team in the world that was quite complete and who was consistently making semis and finals and had even won a trophy to come to this project. They are all there to be elite at the game and to win, and they are used to standards and expectations that Boros does not know, has not experienced, and cannot meet right now. Boros is still on the rise. And he's been boosted artificially by virtue of the fact he's forced in this team because they already had a contract when it was a worse line before, when it was a less ambitious project with less good players and a totally different profile of the people that you had in the squad at that point in time. Like, 
I actually think they were even trying in their frustration to stress to Boros how important this RMR and what he's doing is to them specifically. I think Magus and Zonic especially are almost pleading with him to understand this. And by the way, why should Zonic and Snappy be babysitting? Because that's what this is. You're babysitting him in game, and then you're babysitting him out of the fucking game. Like, what are you, his mom? You have to tell him, like, have you got your socks, Boros? And have you got your fucking inhaler? And have you got your inhales? And have you got your mouse? Oh, shit, you've changed your mouse. I hope you're prepared on that one. Did you do your homework on it? Yes, I did, Mom. Give me a fucking break. He's an adult. He's getting paid thousands and thousands of dollars. He's one of the biggest teams in the world. For, you know what? Have Boris join your fucking favourite team. Fuck you. All these people judging this team when you don't even like Falcons. And you're just loving seeing them fail and hoping that this shit happens to them more and more. Why does Zonic and fucking Snappy and Magus have to put up with this bullshit? Oh, and by the way, I wouldn't say he's always in star roles, but they clearly don't make him a fucking supportive element, do they? And then all he can do is frag, but then he's going to fuck that up by taking away his ability to frag, by engineering poor circumstances from which to play and a poor team environment to be in. They're used to fucking Sphinx and Prime Dupree being in these positions. Not this fucking guy. Aim alone ain't impressive enough when he played with those people. Sphinx has got the aim and the fucking brain. Dupree's an all-around player, a legend with insane experience. Boros was given the chance to play in a super team he had no business being in. He needs to take that chance and win them over and be better than he has ever been in his career. Now, this whole thing... No, no, sorry, they weren't just raging and blaming him. They repeatedly give him compliments about his aim and his talent and what he can do for the team. By the way, that's no small thing for someone like Snappy to go on a bond about your aim. Snappy played with fucking config and nerds. These are stud aimers. Zonic coached Device, Zewu and Sphinx. Monsters of aim. Zonic even says, because a fucking thing, because... We need you. You're, the greatest coach of all time is telling you in an active tournament setting, fuck all this noise. We need you, mate. I need you to do these things and be at this level so we can accomplish what we're trying to accomplish together. Not, you can't do it, get the fuck out of the team. How about this one? For, that's a wake-up call and a half right there. How about this one from Magus? Magus said, at the end of the day, we are still 1-1. And I think we have shown some good things today and we need to stick with that and we need to continue with that. And then we will have the best version of Mo tomorrow and everyone else, of course. It's not only Mo. We also need to be the best version of us again tomorrow. So again, you've been told that all they did is just shit on him and take notes. No, no, they actually tried to even frame and characterize what they were saying to him in a way that they thought would get through to him. And if anything, the spiciness of it was to impress upon him how important this is and how this is not something you can ignore and you've got to address this and be held accountable for it we can't know also what anyone else said because of the editing no one else in their team did this kind of stuff so again when people like well, he could have just said this why are you all just saying it to him because no one else did those things they might have fucked up in the game but this thing overpowers that doesn't it and right afterwards, if you go and watch the video, I can tell most people didn't watch this whole video. Right after this like sequence, Boros himself blames his mouse for his bad start to the tournament and says, and this can make the mood different because I didn't shoot good the first day and that created bad energy in the team. So he himself is even aware of it. And by the way, Snappy then later in the video even says that the issues were fixed for the second day, presumably because they addressed it. One thing I want to take a quick side tangent on is, this is a thing I see all the time online, which is people get into this paradigm, which quite frankly is similar to the idea of Marxism. It's the notion of there's an oppressor and an oppressed. And what you do when you do this extreme polarity is, one is good and one is bad. And so because one is good, everything they do is good. And because one is bad, everything they do is bad. And the one who's oppressing is the bad one and the one who's being oppressed is the good one but that's not how it works is it like a rich guy might be a scumbag to a poor person but that doesn't make the poor person good because the rich guy was bad the poor person also could be bad or fucked up or a scumbag in their own way but maybe not with the same resources so already people want to pick one but when they pick one they just ride with that completely and then how about this if Boros is this shy, vulnerable, just kid, people keep saying that, kid, 19 years old, by the way, kid, without experience, who can't handle being spoken to this way and directly, and, you know, well, then get him the fuck off the team. 
He shouldn't even be there anyway, but that means he definitely shouldn't be there because this is not the environment he can handle. He can't handle, if he can't stand the heat, then get him the fuck out of the kitchen because there are people who can handle the heat and who aren't going to do these things. This is how men speak in these settings. Remember, these games are a proxy for war. In war, if your teammate doesn't follow basic protocols, you fucking die because you rely on him to do his job, to watch your back, to help you with something, to go and do some a mission himself, to do what he said, to be reliable so that you can take action accordingly. This is a proxy for that. This is how men speak. This is how men hold each other accountable. This is even how men bond. Like the end clip, by the way, the mood even shifts because they kind of neg they have exercised the negativity. They've got it off their chest, so now they can go on with the rest of the tournament. And if he's just some kid, then get him the fuck to whatever friendship team with babysitters you want this guy to play. I think he's a talented player. I think in a year or two he could really be good, but he needs the right sort of team, and it ain't this one, and he certainly cannot handle these responsibilities. Then on the whole coaching thing. I'm amazed how many people are inadvertently implying Zonic, the winner of five CS majors, doesn't know how to coach. And Lars Robel, who was there in Astralis and Vitality, is just standing there doing nothing. You've missed the point entirely of what they were doing here. Zonic is someone who holds people accountable. It's one of those famous traits as a coach. It doesn't seem beyond the pale for him at all, especially if you know some of the things inferred that Boris might be doing behind the scenes. His methods have won the most majors in history and had three different five-man lineups be number one in the world over a seven-year span. He has forgotten more about coaching Counter-Strike than almost anyone else will ever know. This looks quite frankly, like an exercise for exactly what they did in this team. Hence, Lars Robel signed off on it or even suggested it. I would speculate, and as I'll get to in a minute, I looked in the video, and I think basically you can quite heavily infer this is just what's happening because he basically says as much, but everyone didn't watch the rest of the fucking video. So basically, the premise I would take is this. You go in a circle privately and usually not filmed, and you get all the issues and frustrations about the game and the team and concerns out so they don't fester and and start working away behind the scenes. And they get addressed, and people know where their teammates' heads are, and you're not actually second-guessing. Is he bothering me? Was he worried about that? Did he blame me for that? Oh, I wonder if they're still thinking about me turning the play. They're not thinking. No, no, you know it's already taken care of. You know it's addressed completely. And then there's this whole thing where if you'd have then lost, people would go, like, but you destroyed their confidence. It's basically what the Zero guy who used to play with Sticko and Hellraisers back in, like, 2017 was saying on Twitter. Well, how about that Apex story? The one where supposedly at PGL Stockholm 2021, when Apex was zero, to, when uh, Vitality was zero two in the Swiss, supposedly Apex just straight up told Zero basically, hey, look, if you don't wake up and start carrying it, we're just going out of this tournament. Like, well, that one worked, didn't it? They did. They got all the way to the quarterfinals. Why is that okay all of a sudden? By the way, what I suggested before is in this video. Factually, it's in this video. First of all, they did a team talk earlier in the day, before I think maybe the first game or something. Seems like that's just usual that they do it this way. And Lars Robel says, now it's time for zoning in. In a few minutes, we'll be in there. Anything that should be said, so people get a chance to speak. And then Lars Robel explains, six minutes into the video, after each match, we have what is called a capture. That is happening right after the match or before we leave the venue. There is no, there, there are no analysis taking place. There are no discussions taking place. It's just for every team member to come forward with reflections or first impressions on the performance because that turns into valuable data later on. And then he says that they have an exercise called... Listen, empty the backpack where we go a little bit deeper if there's something that sticks. By the way, I'm assuming the metaphor of backpack is so that you don't keep carrying it around with you afterwards and having it there to think about and reach into it. You just get rid of it now. You empty it now and you don't have to go back to that again. And by the way, I'm just going to go ahead and speculate that they used exactly these methods in Astralis and Vitality where both Zonic and Lars Robel were and they had massive amounts of success. I also think it's even a very Danish approach. Like I think Danes are a lot more blunt. It's more the Swedes that are conflict diverse. The Danes are more blunt. You'll notice that the Danes in this video, they use the word fucking as like an exclamation mark for emphasis. They don't just say it just because it's cool to swear. They're trying to explain that. Like, this is really important to me. It's like the, how the, god damn, like the Dutch have that fucking that approach to do it. Like, it's like that. And then also, I'm just going to put this out there. It feels like people, because of the story that they've built up around who they are, all of a sudden think Zonic, Magus, and Snappy just completely changed who they are or just 
presumably you had the wrong perception of them. I don't get it. Like, this is who they are. But this is them pushed to the limit of what they can handle by unpro rank unprofessionalism and then someone who isn't actually up to par in the game. I don't care how well you can shoot. Counter-Strike isn't just about shooting. Did the, did the careers of people like Scream and Zantares and fucking, I don't know, Lecro not show you that just shooting people in the head isn't enough? I also think people did over-identify with Boros in this video. Like, yeah, you know what? I'd feel bad if someone speak to, spoke to me that way if I was Boros. But do you know why that wouldn't happen to me? Because I wouldn't do the things Boros did. Would you? Would you be late? Would you change your mouse? Would you have different... Well, then maybe you're a dickhead, so maybe you should identify with him, and maybe we should treat you that way. We also, because it's a video out of the game, we don't see the issues he has in the game or in a prac environment or when he's expected to be professional outside of the game. So because we don't see them and have them happen to us, it's easy to just go, well, you should just forgive him, or is it really that big a deal? We just see, seemingly, a group of older people berating someone, right? So you don't get to feel the frustration they felt from what he did or didn't do necessarily. You just think they're being mean. Think about how, when you play the game, you feel emotion so strongly in the game. But if you come out, you'd go, well, I wouldn't rage. I'd never smash my own mouse. It's only a game, isn't it? Why get upset? Sure, the guy killed you, but there's another round. No, in the game, you don't feel that. In the game, you're so connected to it all. Everything's so important. You're so frustrated when you can't get the kill. And then this fucking teammate did that. And I told him not to, and he flashed me. And all oh, this fucking guy, Ferrari, picks me up. Notice how much more raw that emotion is. But we're cheating because we didn't have to go in that setting and feel that and put up with Boros and see all the stuff he's done or not done. And then lose the game. And then afterwards, we're supposed to go, well, well, now be polite and speak to him in a very kind way. And actually, maybe you can change the sort of tone you're using. No, no, no. Like, this is so unfair what we're doing when we judge videos in this particular way. It's like only seeing a death row inmate get taken down or crying. He's just finished his last meal. He's looking at his mother. Oh, I'm so sorry. He talks to the priest. Oh, my God, you feel so bad, don't you? Why? How can they just kill this man? He's just a human. Can't they understand? But you know what? You didn't see um, when he killed those five kids in cold blood in a horrific manner and taunted their fucking fight. You didn't see that part. So you didn't get the same feeling. You started where you began caring after the thing which is the impetus for why you're in that scenario. That's the same situation that's going on here. That's why it's so unfair how we're looking at this situation. You always have to remember how different it is to observe something with distance and to be there in the thick of it, in the situation. So you might want everything to be nice and people to get along and be respectful, but this is a high stress, high pressure, competitive environment where results not only matter, they get you fucking fired from your job if you don't have them. This RMR gets the Org Falcons millions of dollars to recoup costs for building a super team and buying even out people like Boris. What did they say? It was like $200,000 buyout or something from fucking Monty. This is a big, big deal. The future of the project is affected by this, whether Boris is there in the future or not. And by the way, others get blamed by Falcons and the fans, in my opinion, way more than Boros if this team fails as they did. You think internally they're going crazy. They're going to just bench him or remove him. People like Zonic and Megas have a lot to answer for. By the way, fans are going to treat those players very differently than they treated Boros, you'll notice. I'll even throw this out there. This is why I actually understand why Richard got so angry about the config angle where, because he hurt his leg with that stupid fight, that meant he couldn't travel and go to the RMR and Astralis didn't make the IM Rio Major. And in doing so, his org lost millions of dollars and this dick of money and his player, people like Device just didn't get to go to a major. So it was bigger than just, oh, you hurt your leg, oh, it's a shame for you. I'm sorry you're sad and crying. It's like you actually had an insane effect and impact on other people's lives. And by the way, funnily enough, Config himself actually came out and said in tweets that he didn't think this was that bad and he sort of understood the environment. I do get that this looks really bad. Oh, <laughs> I absolutely am aware of that. Don't worry. That's why the bigger issue, I think, is actually with releasing it. That's the craziest part. I think it's worse that this is released than that it happened by far. Thinking this is transparency is not the fucking move. Yeah, people say, I want transparency. What they mean is I just want things I agree with and like, but then also just transparency. Well, these are inappropriate things to show. Like, this is like some breaking point team liquid angle, but you're still in the team, so how do you release it now? And I also think it's a violation of the players' trust. Like, I'm just going to go ahead and speculate. This does not look like something that these players signed off on. I don't believe Zonic and Snappy signed off on this fucking video. Being, it wouldn't even surprise me if that's why it's now edited after the for-all from the public. I would, I would guess you'll never see a video like this ever again in Falcons. All those players won't be involved in the future, by the way. I think this is an absolute violation of the players' trusts. This is the kind of thing that should never leave the fucking locker room or dressing room, as it were, in a sporting analogy. 
These players were very vulnerable and open and in a way that's only supposed to be for their teammates and within the group, within the circle. And this has just been published to the world. Exactly what they've even said. Even edit it potentially to make them look worse. Like they're just flaming the guy. I thought they actually seemed very earnest and sincere. I didn't think they were just raging and blaming. Actually, I felt like they were trying to win him over and they were almost pleading with him like, please, this means so much more than you realise. This isn't just a throwaway. This is it's our lives. This is everything right now. This is the level we expect you to be at if you want to make it. And we need you more. We need your aim. You won series for us. And there's also the whole editing thing. Like, there are cuts between the people talking. It's not one continuous thing. Well, that's all they said. So when I was like, well, why did he just, like, take turns? And then they all just try to... Because if one of them's saying, like, yeah, and actually, you know, the way you threw that smoke when I was, like, trying to enter on beer, we've got to fix that flex. You wouldn't have that in any way, would you? And also, if this is the empty the backpack segment, that's probably not the main thing you're going to be upset about and talking about. Like, you're not going to include super-duper in-depth stuff that would give away, like, strats and things in the game. I also do think, sadly, the org might have been cynical and thought, well, this is safe to release because we kicked and benched him already. And also, there's the whole reality TV-style feel, right? When you do that, the director wants all the juicy stuff. He wants all the drama. That's the most interesting thing that's going to make people watch. He's going to cut a lot of the other stuff under the cutting room floor, isn't he? So I just don't think that these players signed off on this. I don't buy it. I think it's a big, big mistake, and I don't think they would ever want this shit to be out there you're literally giving an insight. By the way, imagine if you could see like Alex Ferguson just screaming in David Beckham's face, but it might be totally legit coaching. But then David Beckham's a very popular player. And all that goes, oh my God, they're bullying him and being horrible. But you know that if eventually goes on to win everything with this fucking guy. And it's an incredibly successful partnership. And that's an issue I have with this whole thing. When people are judging like, this is an exception. I mean, here's the problem with the zero guy. He seemed like quite a chill guy back in the day. He's never, king he's never had a fucking sniff of winning a major. He knows nothing about what it's like to win at the highest level in Counter-Strike. He can only imagine what it might be like. So I don't really give a monkeys what he fucking thinks or what he thinks is legit. Like I do, in the sense that he was a pro. And I, look, if he has some insight, I'd like to listen to it and collate it with all the others. But the idea, he's going to sort of essentially tell you, like, this isn't the way to do it. Like, how the fuck do you know? How would you know that, mate? Before you go, well, how do you know, Thorin? Because I'm not just doing it because I just rolled out of the womb. Like, oh, I know everything. I have known thousands of eSports competitors. I've even been in these group talks before. I've known thousands of them over a 23-year span and across many different team games and from different cultures, backgrounds, languages, everything. Everything. So think about this for a second. You don't know what successful teams like Astralis and Vitality Team Talks were like. You don't know what this is like when you have all the, your favourite names in the mix and what they said to each other. I actually thought a very telling tweet was this one by Apex here, where when the Zero guy commented, Apex, who was just coached by Zonica, won a major with him, came in and said, being honest is important as well. All those players were really frustrated about it. And if you don't say what you have to, it's wrong. Being open in a team is the most important thing. Trust me. So Zero comes back. Of course, honesty is important, but there's a difference between honesty and beating down on a player one after another. And on top of that, there is also a difference to making it public. Apex replies, I don't necessarily agree on the first part, the idea about the honesty and beating down. And then he goes, but the second part, well, dot, dot, dot. So basically all he agrees with is what I said earlier, they shouldn't have released the video. That's the worst part about it. I also thought, by the way, this Pimp tweet was quite interesting. People say Pimp just goes with the crowd. I actually think he's had a, quite a bold contrarian stance here. He goes, this is fantastic content. It may be unpleasant to watch for some, and that's fair. Doesn't change the fact that it's a hyper-competitive game you're watching, played by hyper-competitive people who wants to win and not see all their hard work go to waste. This clip is not even remotely crossing any lines in my book. You can argue that perhaps Falcon shouldn't have put it out there, but for us fans, it's a fantastic insight. There's a reason why 99% of Reddit gets it wrong every freaking time there's anything remotely controversial happening. You simply don't know, and I don't blame you for it, because how could you? It's more so thinking you know when you don't. Finally, you get raw insight into a top-tier team, and that becomes an issue for many too. I love it. So, okay, I actually thought that was quite interesting, by the way, because Apex obviously was coached by Zonic and was in those raw French teams where they were fucking having a very interesting approach to things. And then in terms of Pimp, right, Pimp knows all of Danish Counter-Strike. He played with Glaive and Magus, when he was Magus boy, and Dupree and Zipnix and Carrigan. He is fully aware of how these people are in teams, how they talk, what kind of like aggressive attitude they might sometimes have or holding people accountable or telling them off. This isn't some shock to him. He's not like, oh, what the, what, what, what's going on? What's going on in here? Like, like Zero is. No, no, no. He just gets it. Like, this is just a vibe in this team. They're trying to win and they, and sometimes that's going to come off to you as toxic, but that's, that's again, if you can't stand the heat, get the fuck out of the kitchen. Speaking of the, those Danish players, 
You think people like Device, Magus, Dupree, Zonic himself, who were all in Astralis, you don't think they're spicy? Device punches monitors when he's angry. Magus used to famously rage and go tomato red. Dupree himself can even get a little bit spicy sometimes. And you've seen Zonic. I mean, Zonic is the guy who benched Carrigan and didn't sign Config because he didn't like their attitude at the time or what they were doing. This guy has fucking balls of steel. What are you talking about? Oh, and let's just throw it out there. You think those Na'Vi teams with fucking Simple and Zeus weren't people absolutely mouthing at each other? I mean, that shit even used to get caught on camera. I've stood behind those teams and watched them just say outrageous shit in Russian to each other while the other guy's still alive in the round that they're seeing it to. And then just basically like verbally abuse each other after a lost map. Before map two of the fucking best of the they'd have to go back out and play. So just because you aren't from their culture or this background or you haven't experienced high-level competition, don't imagine you know especially not when you don't have like i said a b testing there's not like a famous documentary about fanatic where they never do any of this and they're all lovely but there, there's no comparison what are we comparing it with at this point in time by the way those polls of neo and taz and stuff back in 1.6 they used to actually have like verbal and potentially fist fights during ongoing tournaments and then win those tournaments or win the next match and go on and continue on and win championships later on and they were saying stuff to each other like you are a fucking dog or like you are brain dead and you can't like they were insulting each other to the fucking hilt there's a different culture, though. I mean, there's all thing I tried to point out on Steak and Banter, which is what I've learned from League of Legends. So League of Legends, you have the LCS, the North American League, and you have the LPL, the Chinese League. And North American League, the best they've ever done is one semi-final run at Worlds, that once ever. Meanwhile, the Chinese ones have won the World Championship a bunch of times. And the difference when you see these documentaries come out is, in the LCS, famously, their whole, like, discussions in teams are never like this. It's all just people using passive-aggressive language and corporate speak of, like, well... The way that um, the top lane uh, laned this time made me feel uncomfortable and that made me nervous about how we were going to run. And you have to do it in such like careful, like, you never get to the central point. And as a result, people don't address the really important things. They do fester. People just secretly talk shit about each other privately one-on-one. -on -one. That guy gets kicked months later. He doesn't know what he did. He never had a chance to improve. Never even knew this was a massive issue, preying on the minds of his teammates. And he gets booted. And even worse, it feels like, for, for what? There wasn't an issue. Everything was all fine. And they said it was just a small thing. At one time, they mentioned it in a vodry, but it wasn't a big deal. And that's the difference. And they get no results internationally. Meanwhile, you watch these documentaries of like the Chinese teams. There's one of Team WE and EDG. And their coach is just saying really harsh stuff to their team telling them it's totally unacceptable and you're letting me down and you're fucking the game up and the way you played was stupid there it's not how we do it in practice and get your fucking shit together and you you're the star player we expect more from you if you're going to be in this team and when they do that all these fans already go oh they're horrible they're being mean and terrible and you'll never win if you do that like if you just berate someone and learn, roar their confidence you'll never and these people going to win the world championship afterwards and win the LPL the hardest league in the world because that's the problem with this topic you like the results but you don't like the methods meanwhile on the other one you like the methods but then you don't like the results well you know what i'd love to live in a world where you can just have very lovely conversations and all be friendly and then also be world champions i just don't know if we live in that world and i don't know where the example is and if there was one example wouldn't that be the fucking the exception that proves the rule shouldn't it be like the most consistent winners in counter strike and league of legends of starcraft should all be the people who are just super super fucking lovely it's never any of the ones that dispute and have argued but i'll tell you it's the other way around Actually, you do have high expectations and you hold people accountable because you're men going into battle. And that is how you're able to give your all and then fucking sleep soundly without torturing yourself over what you could have done or should have said or something you wish you'd addressed beforehand, but now it's too late and you've lost the tournament already. Classic one was obviously Team Liquid 2016. I always thought, the reason I myself, even though I'm now a massive fan of Elige, used to go out of my way to point out that he had his own attitude issues, is because they didn't manifest, obviously, if, if you were stuck in the North American bubble. Simple was obvious, because he was just straight up telling people in practice, did you say I am not good? How dare you say that? I can't play with this guy. He should adopt. Like, that's obviously toxic. He's obviously been a dickhead when he complains at you. But you can resolve that quickly. And he gets it off his chest, and you know exactly that he's upset with you and over this issue. Elige his approach was more the sort of like you have the whole conversation he doesn't say the thing that's bothering him he doesn't bring it up he doesn't force a confrontation he doesn't reply maybe to a simple when he has an issue with him instead he goes he opens that steam fucking chat starts to, you hear him and you just see all these lines of text and then magically you're like well there we go he's talking trash to that one and behind the scenes they're all doing a poll do we stay in the team or not do we kick simple or not do we keep in the, do we talk to steve or not like 
That's not, that's worse. That takes way longer to address. That's why a year later they tried to boot Elise out of the team and he for real almost ended up on that team with fucking Dazed and Swag for realsies. He almost was kicked out in 2017 when he came back and it all ended up being great. So that, that kind of like toxicity, because it's passive aggressive, can hide itself a lot longer and lurk beneath the surface. The simple one must be addressed immediately and certainly is unacceptable in different ways, but you get out of the way really quickly and you can sort of like polish off some of the rough edges of a simple. It's a lot harder to get someone like a lease to actually address what they're doing and then expand out and actually reflect and change themselves, isn't it? That's a little bit more tricky when they're not saying anything because it's hard to blame someone for inaction, isn't it? It's a lot easier to blame actions you don't like. By the way, I, I addressed it earlier, but the most famous coach in English football is Alex Ferguson. Sir Alex Ferguson of Manchester United. Won a bazillion English Premier Leagues. Won the fucking Champions League a few times. A fantastic coach. And one of the more things he is the most infamous for is giving people the hairdryer treatment. The metaphor being that because he's in front of your face talking in such an angry, Scottish, red-faced fucking rant that his breath is like a hairdryer. The heat of it just on your face constantly. You're like, fucking hell, bloody hell. And that's what he would do at half time or after games to certain people when they fucked up. Even when, by the way, they were like stud world-class players like David Beckham, like fucking Rude Van Nistelrooy or Yap Stam. By the way, motherfuckers like Yap Stam who look like a fucking Viking berserker warrior who's going to go to warrior war and kill 50 people and he'll just go right in his face and tell him what he doesn't fucking think is acceptable what he was doing and how he was playing and did that then go and destroy their confidence and ruin the team morale and you'll never win if you do that no they didn't zero they went on to win the treble in fucking football including the Champions League they went on to win like the most Premier Leagues ever again and again and again and with different totally different sets of talents over the years moving through generations and working with young players if you don't know zero Alex Ferguson, famously, they said he can't win with kids. He brought in all the kids, Nicky Button, Gary Neville, and fucking David Beckham, and he and Paul Scholes, and he fucking won the Premier League and had the most successful dynasty of all time in fucking English football, arguably, with a core of kids. So did, to actually being harsh with these kids, did it wreck them completely? No, because it's the way he did it, and I've got a very key point I want to make here. Crucially, he wasn't their friend, was he? Years later, he might have been a friendly figure. He wasn't at the time, because he understood you need a healthy degree of separation between you as the coach and your player because in a way you're their boss you're overseeing the project you're responsible for it even if it isn't all your fault and so because you're responsible for it you can't just be a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with the player because when you're friends with someone and you're equals now if someone goes you won't believe this but I was out last night on the piss and I got it late but the court manager didn't see me so lol if you're his mate you go ha ha you fucking rascal well you know what Make sure he doesn't catch you, because that's how a friend and a colleague might relate to each other. I'll tell you what, though. If that's, like, the coach and you say that to him, then the part of him that's the coach is like, so you're fucking risking this whole game and messing up. If you play worse now and your energy isn't there, it's because you were out drinking. Like, you've really let me down here. That's the problem. In this scenario... It's funny if your friend messes around. It's actually not if your co-worker, who you're just there to succeed with, and you're not there for friendly business, or even worse, your employee does it. That's going to be way, way worse. Haven't you noticed how all the great coaches in sports history are described by their players, especially their most successful players, as father figures? Not as their friend, not as the cool uncle. No, it's that they were like a father to me because they became the man who led me, who directed me, who disciplined me, who took me aside, who taught me the hard lessons of life, but sometimes let me cry on his shoulder, but then also gave me the kick up the arse when I needed it and held me accountable and helped me be better than even I knew I was capable of being because they saw something more of me and they demanded more of me and they put a bar up here that I had to rise up to and meet, otherwise I wouldn't have made it and I could have gone to another team and I could have played with my talent and played in a less disciplined and less structured environment, but what did I have won the same? I'm thankful to him that he disciplined me that way he was a father figure to me. That's what Zonic is trying to be in fucking Astralis, if you ask me. I think players have even described him that way. Fans just want to believe in these fairy stories because of fucking Hollywood movies. Like, I've always thought they go too ham always on the whole power of friendship. By the way, how did power of friendship work out in fucking heroic, eh? You all thought it's okay that they come second and third because they all love each other. They have great speeches and they believe in each other so they just think that it's better to play with each other than elsewhere. And it turns out behind the scenes that actually they were having a mutiny. And actually, like, Stoudy Yabby didn't feel that way. And actually, there was some, like, big fucking resentment between them and a big back and forth. And it wasn't the power of friendship. And actually, probably coming in second and third was pissing them off. And people were getting upset with that. And maybe people were even got upset with the IGL having all the attention and all the fame and all the adulation. Meanwhile, they're the ones trying to put the numbers in the game. 
Friendship is a fucking bonus. But it can't get in the way of team success if success is the most important thing to you. If friendship's the most important, definitely don't do any of this. But go and be a fucking loser and play in some dog shit team that no one gives a fuck about and come ninth place and then cry your eyes out if once you finish top eight and never address any problems. But if you want to be excellent, then you figure out everything else must be sacrificed for the goal of being excellent. What's that Kobe Bryant line? It's something like, friendships come and go, but banners hang forever. That's what people like Zonic Magus and Snappy understand. You've heard the stories about Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. Oh, they're such assholes. So unacceptable the way they behaved. They were so harsh to people. And then firstly, there are people who even literally say, yeah, it was the worst time of my life working for Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. But you know what? I'm so incredibly proud of what I accomplished then. Even though I hated their methods, I actually do love that I was a part of something monumental and epic. And I did work that I never thought I could do in the time frame I never thought I could do. And I accomplished things that I, I and others in my field thought were impossible. There's even stories that people quit because they're burned out and can't handle like the hardcore nature of these guys and then they come back later because when they went elsewhere to the less pressure job or an environment where you're not uh, creating something excellent it wasn't stimulating it wasn't amazing you didn't feel as alive as much as it was hard and incredibly intense when you were there so look these people didn't even do what a Steve Jobs or Elon Musk did. I'm giving you extreme examples here. They were way more reasonable, in my opinion, especially considering they're dealing with a player that never even should have been there. He never even had the qualifications to walk through that door and put that Falcons jersey on next to people like Magisk and fucking Zonic and Snappy. He is in no position to even do that. So since they had to deal with it, actually, I think in the end, they might have got a bit too harsh, especially in terms of it being released to the public. I hate that part. But I actually even think think they tried to balance it out. They seem like they even tried to make it clear to him that it's not just him. They're not trying to just pick on him and they do need him and they care about him and they want him to get engaged and they want to just get his shit together and be more professional so they can get through the qualifier and then potentially he can be a, a key part of their squad going forwards. But in the case that they were just being horrible to him for fuck's sake. Hey guys, this is Pimp here. I uh, got another little trick for you guys. Uh, I heard about this uh, channel on YouTube that has a lot of good analysis on it. You know, a lot of good points to be made and uh, fuck. I did it again. It's just Thorne's stupid YouTube channel. Hear me now. Because the thing is, I wouldn't be able to get all the work I do without my brethren, the man Dem in the Skrilluminati, my Patreon community. Because this video, like all of them on my channel, is kindly supported by Frisky, Matt Pugnaccio Racula, Ahmed Haju, Jensen Gore, Tobias Berners-Gorny, Animosity, Toucan, Tosh, and you know it, a special thanks always goes out to Jerky's Minion, who always has my back. Would you like to ask a question in my regular AMAs? Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest I could take in my work? Do you want teasers? Find out who the upcoming guests are going to be. Maybe you want to be part of those lengthy esports discussions I do with my top donators. Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today, where? Via the Patreon link in the description box below.